Hope remains our guiding light. Resilience our battle cry. Stronger is the mission of our audacity. Bolder the promise and the light. Larger are the pillars we have become. Expanding confidence for the turn. Together we rise. Brighter and better. Together we overcome. to a webinar on your brand. Discover, create, and communicate your personal brand. I'm Susan Brown, who will be guiding the proceedings. This initiative is an undertaking of the final year integrated marketing communication students at the Western Jamaica campus of the University of the West Indies, Mona. We're charged with the responsibility of designing a project to implement and evaluate for their final year course communication, analysis, and planning. This project targets influencers, content creators, entrepreneurs, as well as high school students, college and university students preparing to enter the job market, um, which is a major undertaking. Okay, so this um, initiative is a major undertaking in which in the pre-COVID-19 years would have been creating a buzz on the campus. Last year, we are meeting in a virtual space, even as we look forward to personal reconnections in short order. After what will no doubt be a highly informative discussion, we're expecting to see comments such as excellent event execution, well done, enlightening, and all the kudos that can be mustered by our audience joining us virtually. After all, the students' grades are tied to your feedback as well. We crave your full support and ask that you remain until the end of the program and win special prizes. If you're not present, you don't stand a chance. This event is a culmination of intense planning by the group of 14 students, namely Nordia Panto, Sasha Lynn Hay, Ruth and Nesbeth, Zaria Nasmith, Dina Shea McIntosh, Avery Hyatt, Sebastian Jones, Shamoon Gordon, Shana K. Brown, Lacey Johnson, Janelle Francis, Neil McFarlane, Kima Brown, and Pete Campbell, the lone male in the class. These students are deftly guided by their lecturer, Dr. Alpha Obika, whom we recognize along with other members of academia, our panelists, specially invited guests, sponsor representatives, parents, and all-round supporters. This production is one of four events that is being held this week during the Caribbean School of Media and Communications Open Week. Updates on other events can be found on Carmack's Instagram page at Carmack underscore Uimona. We ask for your continued support. At this time, we invite Dr. Patrick Pendergast Director of the, Un of the West Indies, University of the West Indies, Mona, Western Campus, to address us. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. Thank you so very much, panelists, distinguished ladies and gentlemen all. Um, on behalf of the University of the West Indies, Mona, Western Jamaica Campus, I bring you greetings and wish you nothing but the best. I expect a very successful engagement. This is a very important activity in the life of the students who are responsible for staging this event. And, and so it is as important for them to gain as many lessons from the discussion as it is for you who have been invited to this webinar. I am particularly happy to celebrate with the Caramac at WJC students who are carrying on a tradition established 10 or so years ago when I was searching for a, a meaningful way to ensure that Caramac's brand and leadership formed part of the UE culture being established then. For historical context, that was the early days of the WJC being set up in Montego Bay. And so on a personal level, I, I, I thank you for carrying on that tradition. Some of your panelists were part of that early experiment uh, slash experience as a campus director, I'm also happy to see that you're discussing branding, especially in an 
open, online, and almost virtual environment. No doubt you recognize that understanding branding at both institutional and, and the individual level, that's critical to the sustainability of productive relationships, which you are definitely going to be needing uh, heading out into the world uh, right after this series of activities. So indulge me a little as I wish to throw three quick points in the mix for consideration this evening. The first one is when it comes to branding, it is important that you know yourself, know your worth, but you should also remember that you are not an island. Second thing is that brand creation is as much about understanding others as it is about knowing yourself or defining yourself. So be careful that your brand actually advances your relationship with others. And the third thing is that a big part of WJC brand is what people call the sense of family. It is important, though, that we understand that we are family, not because we are small, but because of its values. We embrace the values of family. We care. We support. We encourage. We stand together stronger in our strengths. We overcome together confident in our capacity to find our bold. So when we say we are bold as part of that brand, we are not afraid to innovate and to find solutions. And that's exactly what this exercise is about. We are inclusive, we are diverse, we are success driven. And that is why student success is paramount. That is why staff success is so integral to maintaining the legacy of excellence that is embedded in what we call brand UWI. So this is UEMONA Western Jamaica campus, changing lives, transforming communities. It is in that context that I wish you all the best with your event and hope that everyone participating this evening will benefit from the engagement. May success be always yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Patrick Pendergast. And you know that your brand is always being supportive of students and always staying connect connected. That is a part of your brand. We thank you very much for participating today. So in recent times, we've been hearing more and more persons talking about their brand and referring to themselves as a brand. What is this brand of which they speak? According to Karma Kalum, Dr. Hume Johnson, an established brand strategist, author of a book titled Brand You, and a communication professor, cultivating a strong brand is about gaining clarity about who you are. We're in sync here, Dr. Prendergast and the unique value you bring to the table in your industry or niche. For ones of us who are of the belief that daily social media postings and racking up followers is tantamount to building an excellent brand. Is there positive and negative brand and branding? Everything you post on social media communicates something about your personal brand. As with every post, you're telling the world something about who you are. Your social media, therefore, is not a brand, but a reflection of it. Do you know that even in Jamaica, majority of employers are now searching job applicants' online footprint as a point of research and assessing prospects? The bonus is on you then to ensure that whatever you post is in sync with the values of the company or organization for which you are or plan to be seeking employment. This afternoon and into this evening, we will be doing a deep dive exploring personal branding. And to kick off, we have a most erudite trio on the panel for discussion. It will all give us varying perspectives on personal branding and its, and its significance at any time, but especially in these times. I will briefly introduce our panelists, following which they will each make a bridge opening statement on personal branding. So we'll, and, and after which we'll get straight into the discussion. So at first I will introduce all three of our panelists and then they will make their, present, their opening statements. So in the panel discussion, there will be a question and answer segment where you, members of our virtual audience, get the opportunity to participate. We therefore ask that you send your questions in the chat 
and indicate the panelists you wish to answer. So let me at this time introduce Ms. Kadia Francis, who is a multidisciplinary or multidisciplined digital professional and the founder of the Digital Jamaica Platform, an information and education resource dedicated to the education, promotion, and overall growth of Jamaican tech and digital growth. She's convinced that the future of everything is digital and firmly believes in the immense potential of these spaces to advance small island states like Jamaica, as it enables ordinary citizens to build legitimate online businesses with access to global markets. Kadia is a graduate of the other university, University of Technology, where she pursued a degree in law. And then next we have Ms. Jo Marie Malcolm Gordon, who is a civil attorney turned brand strategist with over a decade of experience in brand strategy and graphic design. She has created a dynamic career leveraging her legal expertise to elevate and advance the branding experience for our clients. As the founder and chief branding maverick of Malcolm Maverick's creative consultancy, consultancy he communicates differentiation in a congested marketplace by helping businesses and individuals gain clarity and confidence in their unique stories. She's also the communications director of CorpCare, a corporate social responsibility consultancy firm dedicated to assessing, diagnosing, and supporting the implementation of CSR strategies for measured impact in the Jamaican private sector. As part of her commitment to civic engagement, Jo Marie is a member of the Global Shapers Kingston Hub and provides mentorship and education to young entrepreneurs and branding novices. And then we have Mr. Stephen R.K. Campbell, who is the consummate communicator, an assistant lecturer at Carimac, Mona. Stephen is also a journalist, podcaster, and producer who has worked on investigative stories for the Caribbean Investigative Journalism Network. is a contributor to the Western Bear newspaper in Montego Bay. He has also produced several radio programs and documentaries. This communication consultant is currently pursuing a PhD in social policy at Louis Mona, a place he loves, no doubt. His, area of, his areas of specialization include investigative journalism, organizational communication, communication on taboo subjects, social policy, and the role of media in public information and education. So without further ado, at this time, I invite Ms. Kedia Francis to make her opening statement, to be followed by Ms. Malcolm and then Stefan. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to uh, Caramac and your final year students for inviting me to be a part uh, of this panel. I'm always excited to be on a panel with Jo Marie <laughs> and um, other persons uh, here. And I'm also glad to see a lot of uh, female faces. That's always a good thing. <laughs> So um, as you would have heard, my name is Kadia Francis. I am uh, I'm into everything online. I am very much a busybody um, when it comes to the digital space. Uh, it was back in 2015 when I was in my second year um, doing my LLB at the other university, <laughs> uh, UTEC, when I uh, discovered, discovered Christopher Columbus style uh, the digital space, because um, as you know, textbooks can be expensive and um, law books are even more so expensive. Uh, so it was a difficulty because I had to decide, am I going to pay my school fees or am I going to buy textbooks? The two things weren't happening. So I had to find other means of accessing um, the resources that I needed to graduate or to pass my exam so I could graduate because I also could not afford to repeat a course <laughs> or a module. So I turned to the digital space and, and through, um, and it's funny 
because the things that you actually learn while you're in university that are not necessarily module based, you can then pull those over into other areas. So while doing law, you learn how to do research, you learn legal research and other things like that. And I used that skill that I would have developed to find these, um, pull them over into the digital space and find these resources. And I was able to do so successfully. I actually graduated with an honors degree. Uh, so, um, so that's the power of digital. And when I say that it, it, it is a means by which small island states like Jamaica can actually enter into global markets and be competitive, I kid you not. There, there's absolutely nothing that we can't do online. There are virtually no skills that you can't transfer into the digital space and actually earn from. And that's not something that would have been available to us if we did not have access to the information that we have, if we did not have access to the digital devices and platforms um, that we have. And the one thing I'd say, um, even though I probably shouldn't, but I'm gonna say, is that I wish that our marketing courses were more digitally inclined, um, in incorporated more of a digital marketing element um, it doesn't at the moment, unfortunately, and what you find is that our students are coming up with the, with a knowledge of marketing, yes, but not so much the digital aspects of it, and in a way, it's a disadvantage to them, so I'm actually glad that we're having this conversation now, even though we're talking about social media, which is just one aspect of it, but at least we're having the conversation, and hopefully, uh, later on, we can be more inclusive in our, off in our marketing offerings, so that we're producing more um, well-rounded uh, students when it comes to the marketing um, landscape. So I'm excited to be here and I'm happy to talk to you guys about basically how I have actually used the digital space to brand myself and actually ended up here talking to you guys. So I look forward to that. Okay, so um, Katie, you know, digital according to you is a great equalizer, right? It is. And, you know, I mean, maybe what we should do is it is not a plug, really. But if you want, you know, when it comes to UA, we produce all rounded students who are exposed, right, Dr. Fendergast, to digital marketing offering. So they understand the value of it. And they know this from year one. Okay? All right. Good. So, <laughs> Ms. Malcolm, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to say a special thank you to the organizers of this event. Um, I, I felt special from the invitation. So I'm, I just love the fact that, you know, I, I can't even put it into words, but I just want to celebrate the students for what I envision will be a job well done because I know this is not easy. And so I just want to take the time to celebrate you. It is my privilege and honor to be here. I want to celebrate the technical team who ran the test. Um, Madam moderator, my fellow panelists, Katie, I'm my partner in crime at this point, because I feel like, you know, we're just sharing panel space. Um, Stefan, who I'm who I'm really looking forward to get to know better and just you, the amazing audience that is present today. Um, you might be wondering how a lawyer became a brand strategist. I don't have the full answers for you. However, what I will say is that personal branding has always been a passion of mine because what I understand about it is that it is a story of transformation. So similarly, where by using personal branding, you can position yourself for the opportunities that you really want, for the things that you want to accomplish. And through that clarity and confidence, you are able to, to really just be clear about who you are, most importantly, who you are not. And so you can speak to the world and speak to the community in a way that's very distinctive. And you can position yourself for those opportunities. Um, one of the... What a very quick anecdote about positioning yourself and branding, especially when you're a multi hyphenate or you have a lot of things going on. Um, I never forget that on Twitter they had something that says, you know, what did you want to be when you want when you wanted to grow up and what are you doing now? And of course, I wanted to be a lawyer when I was a child. I still am a lawyer, but of course, I'm a brand strategist. So I said, oh, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer. And then someone on Twitter said, boy, you know, God had other plans for you. Um, you know, you are really supposed to do brand strategy. And that to me was a bigger compliment because I would have successfully positioned myself out of that legal framework, which is not a bad thing. 
It's just that where the story I want to tell now is more so inclined to speak about brand strategy because it is the, at the intersection of the things that I love the most. Helping people, helping people more importantly to unlock their confidence and their potential and also really just creating great aesthetics because not to get into it, but I'm a really an aesthetics girl. So, you know, I've been loving the branding of the webinar. I just want to put that out there. Um, but definitely, it is a pleasure and privilege to be here. I'm looking forward to what will be a great conversation. And I'm hopeful that you will walk away from this experience that much more um, enriched and that much more educated on the topic of personal branding. Thank you. Sir Stefan? Good evening, Suzette. Um, good evening to my fellow panelists, Joe, uh, Joe Marie and Kadia. And to the organizers, I was telling them yesterday that time flies so, so quickly because I remember when they just started at Ye High in, 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 in Karamak and now they are you know, doing big things with this, with this event. And the moment they asked me to be a panelist, it was without a doubt, without question that I was definitely going to be part of it. So Congrats in advance for, for doing something like this. My role here, and when I say here, not just in this panel, but in, in, in life is essentially about influencing the influencers. Now, the digital space is a space that I, had, I, I, I have grown to accept and, ha and, and has grown to see the value in my own life because... I believe that even though we're talking about social media and personal branding online, it's about understanding your value offline first. And a lot of people get confused because they believe that followers or a certain amount of followers and a certain amount of likes and retweets equates to impact. That's not always the case. So a significant element of personal branding is understanding what your value is in life before you transmigrate that person or that personality or that branding online. No, some people are known for their online branding and not necessarily known in their, in, in their real life. But again, you need to define what that brand is for yourself, right? And to understand. So the first thing is identifying, identifying what that value is. And the other, the other eye is understanding what the concept of integrity is. Because we also find, especially in this age of cancer culture, that a lot of people are, their brand online is so far removed from who they are as a person. And there's a distinction between somebody who has integrity and their reputation. You might have a very good reputation online. But reputation is people's perception of you. Integrity is who you are when no one is looking. So I encourage everyone, when you are building your personal brand, to be someone of integrity. This generation, this day and age, they are very, very unforgiving about people who are dishonest, who are living double lives. So I encourage every single person to shape and define yourself in a way that is not dishonest to yourself and also to the world. You cannot be all things to all people. You cannot be all things to all people. And the good thing about the digital space is that there is a space, there is a niche, there is a gap for people of all different backgrounds, all, all, all types of content, all platforms. There is that space. So there is room for you to decide. A few years ago, if we had done this, I don't think we, we, we would have gotten the type of excitement that we are now getting when it comes to personal branding and content creation. Because when you looked at the usage of the, of the world, the global north were, were the producers and the global south were the consumers. Meaning that we would spend a lot of time on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, consuming content that was given to us or created for us. Now we are seeing a shift and I love it that we are creating content, our own stories about our own selves for the world to consume, right? So those are the considerations I would start with, some of the things that I would like for us to think about, and we can take it from there. But again, thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel, and congrats in advance. Okay, well said. Going right into the discussion then, um, I'm just going to throw this out. 
to simplify it for our audience, what exactly is personal branding and is it a recent phenomenon? Okay, there, Joe Marie, Stefan. Okay. <laughs> Starting with the sun or the roses. So, <laughs> so, like with every other, you know, term, because we will have a lot of these buzzwords and stuff that we throw on, like with any other one of these terms, it's not that it's hard to define what personal branding is, but depending on who you're talking to, the definition um, may change. But as, as far as I'm concerned, personal branding allows you, an individual, to what I call exercise your expertise in the digital space so that you can be visible and that you can be relevant. Now, whatever the, the, the end goal of doing that is, is up to the individual who is uh, putting in effort to brand themselves in the digital space. So it may be for economic reasons, you may want to get headhunted um, by a particular company, or you may want to uh, start some kind of entrepreneurial endeavor, or it, it doesn't matter what the reason is why you're, why you're doing it. The fact is that you're making some kind of concerted effort to uh, develop a message or messages that uh, are to communicate yourself to persons in a particular way. And uh, Stefan talked of just now about, you know, the personality that you are um, coalescing with the personality that you are offline, right? So, but with personal branding, it's what you want your audience to see, what you, the perception that you want to yeah. uh, give off or communicate to your audience. That's a very strong part um, of it. You may, not, you may not be able to communicate all aspects of your personality but again depending on why you're using these spaces uh to put yourself out there the messaging uh is going to be different it could be too that the messaging is different based on the platform that you are using uh to to um to communicate that message but it's there's so much involved and there's so many layers to it but in a nutshell personal branding is you putting yourself out there and expert exercising your expertise, whatever it is. And when I said exercising your expertise, it may be in speech. You may want to start a podcast. You may want to write a blog, however way you communicate what your skill sets are or what it is that you're particularly good at doing in a way that will attract something to you. Again, it could be for economic reasons. That to me is what personal branding uh, is or in, in effect how it works. Okay, and rolled up in that will be integrity, right? Because I mean, it is it is disingenuous of a travel writer, say, or travel blogger, to go, you know, lay a towel on a on a, a mound of construction sand and take a photo, post it on Instagram, and say they're in Dubai or wherever on the beach, you know. So integrity is all wrapped up in that as well, right? Right. We, we, I mean, in 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 digital marketing parlance, we call that authenticity being authentic uh, mm -hmm. right so so that's what our authenticity is because when you start talking about the elements of digital um personal branding you talk about community development or community building um you are not an expert quote unquote if you don't have an audience who believe in that expertise right and that's your community so in terms of building that connection between your brand and your community authenticity is a core uh, part of that you need them to believe you when you say something and uh -huh. um, being authentic or as best as possible being authentic will help you uh, uh, solidify that connection um, with them and, and as Stefan said connection um, cancer culture is real and it is very difficult once that trust has been broken between you and your community to rebuild that and uh -huh. see that happen with small personal brands as well as um, big brands. It, it has happened. When that connection gets broken, you find you have to work double time and sometimes you can't repair the damage to your reputation once it's gone. So you always try to be as authentic um, as possible with your messaging and how you are communicating yourself to your audience for sure. Yeah. Drummer, do you think the idea of personal branding is commonly misunderstood? Um, to some extent, yes. And let me explain, you know, why. So 
personal branding, as Katie and Stefano alluded to, there is a value system involved, there is authenticity involved, there is integrity involved. But the key thing is to understand that branding in and of itself is really someone's gut feeling about you. So when mm. you start from that point, you realize that the most you can do with your personal brand is influence that gut feeling. And so a lot of persons think that, oh, in order for me to have a personal brand, I need to lie about who I am. I need to not be, I need to be disingenuous. So whether it be the towel on the cement and I'm in Dubai, or whether it be the prop money that you're showing me to say that you've made this amount of money in your business when really, again, it's prop money, so it's not real. Um, whether it be things along that line, the common misconception is that people think that there is a line of being disingenuous that is required for personal branding. I am here to tell you that you brand every single day. If you strip mm. the world of its very technical term, it's a first impression. It's a continuing impression. It's a lingering impression. It's the reason why even the organizers of this event would have chosen these panelists because they would have said, whatever story Stefan Kedia and Joe Maria are telling, it's congruent with what I want my audience to hear. It's congruent with what I'm trying to with what I'm trying to portray in this event. And so for me, the starting point is understanding that you are branding all the time. When it gets a little misconstrued is when you do not, you've not taken the time to do the self-work. And the self-work comes with understanding who you are as a person. Stefan would allude to this earlier in his opening statement in that social media is really just a matter of, it's an amplification, it's a projection. But before you even get there, you have to start with who you are as a person. You have to start with, okay, what are my values? Integrity has to be a core part. For a lot of people, integrity is not a core part. And that's why even if they gain popularity, you know, at some point in time, there is going to be this disruption or there's going to mm -hmm. be potential ruin because, again, they were not anchored by core values. So I think that the, 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 the key thing for persons to do is anchor yourself to these core values because the analogy I like to use is that social media is a sea. And if you think about it, it can be big waves, small waves, you could be on the shore. But mm -hmm. I prefer that you spend more time on the shore clarifying who you are, clarifying your message, really just amplifying your authenticity before you go there and misrepresent who you are. Because again, Kada would have mentioned this, that you have to start with why. The why differs across um, the individual, but why are you going on social media? Because when you start with your why, you're actually more targeted. You're more, you're, more, you're more likely to position yourself for the unique opportunities that you want. But that misconception that I just want to really emphasize is that you, you can't be yourself and brand. It's actually the other way around. We want you to be yourself. But again, how are you going to remain yourself when you are on social media being directly influenced by things that are either creating envy either creating jealousy or creating some sense of inadequacy for you that you mm. are losing sight of who you are. So before mm. you even go on Twitter and sign up for your account, I want you to do the work of who am I as a person. And when you start there, it will be easier for you to navigate which, where you want to put your personal brand because your personal brand doesn't need to be everywhere, first of all right mm -hmm. you might decide that based on the unique opportunities you want for yourself you're going to live on linkedin instagram is not your friend facebook you don't care but i just want to emphasize the importance of clarifying who you are as a person and what you stand for before going on this quest to do personal branding because again remember that you're branding every day you're telling me a story about yourself every day. The only thing that's changing now is that you're being intentional. And a really quick misconception, clear up, is that some people think being intentional about your story means you're editing it and you're only showing the pretty parts. No. It's the reason why, yes, I'm an attorney and yes, I'm a brand strategist, but I tell you I'm a brand strategist first. And when you get to know me, you can know the other facets. Because as Kaya would have mentioned, it's not for you to tell everything all at once, but for you to start off with something that one, I can believe in, and one, I was, okay, I, I, I sent your authenticity here. And then from there, we can move into getting to know you better. So definitely, I, I, I highly recommend gaining that self-clarity before even going online. Okay. Um, but then uh, I just want us to be clear that personal branding is it just about um, what you show online? You know, the way you, I mean, there'll be a particular reason why you choose to wear this houndstooth 
um, talk to, right. to, to the webinar today. You know, why, why Patrick is sitting on a plain background because I understand the way his brain works. And I stand right. and there is um, Kadia with the light coming in through the window. So everything we do is wrapped up pretty much in our, in our, in our brand. And, and right. is that all of us then have a brand? Um, first to Stefan, um, is personal branding confined to any specific vendor age group? And when is a good time to start developing personal brand? You know, listening to Joe Marie talk, and I just I was just nodding and agreeing uh, in terms of doing the work. The reality is, our education system doesn't focus on us doing work on ourselves. When you when you look at how we teach our children, we we, we tell them what they want to be when they grow up. We ask them what they want to be when they grow up, not who. Right. So our culture is is, is really about perception from the very beginning, without even understanding who you are and who you want to be, you want to be. Right. So I think from the very from the very beginning, from the very onset, a brand is attached to you. The older you get is the more power you have to rebrand and realign what you think that brand means for yourself. Right. And and it's not just the surface. It's what are your values and how do your values lead to your value? Right? So your value to the organization, your value to your family, your value to society and all of those things. And, 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 and I mean, when I started UE, there was a sentiment, it's not what you know, but who you know. And the more you look at the digital space, you realize it's flipped. It's not who you know, it's who knows you. And it's not just who knows you, it's what are you known for? And these are the questions you need to ask yourself. And there's a little activity that I do when I, when I do branding for organizations. Two sheets of paper. You define what your brand is in your own mind. What are some of the, the, the words? Are you happy, angry, ambitious? What are some of those things? And give it to another group of people or, or someone else and let them write down some adjectives. How much do those things intersect? Somewhere in between there is your personal brand. And as, and as Joe, as Joe Marie and Kedia said, you know, it's not just about what you believe about yourself, but it's also the perception. And so it's a constant dialogue. It's a constant um, openness. It's a constant conversation. So your, your personal brand is not static, but it's about this group of people that I deem to be valuable or I would like to add value to have this certain perception of, of, my, of, of who I am. But it's not in line with what I want to be or who I want to be. How can we reconcile those things, right? And, 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 and that's where the work is, right? But you have to have, and I love the analogy, Jumari said, uh, start on the sand. You have to have an idea of where you want to be. And there's a book that I used. Um, unfortunately, I had a very traumatizing experience in 2017, and I deleted all of my, my digital um, presence. Because it was, you know, you had a e pray love something just threw your life off and you had to reflect. And there was this book that sort of brought me back by this guy called Eric Coleman, E. Coleman, right? The um, Digital Leadership and Success. And how we need to simplify our lives online and offline. And how we need to understand that social media are tools that we use and not to be used by social media and every platform gives you a different opportunity to utilize those tools to utilize that tool to shape and to chisel out what your brand is right so you need to understand the inherent meaning and value of each tool linkedin is is used for a different thing than but than instagram the only commonality is you and who you are and how you um can utilize that also, to okay. just to quickly touch on it, that they're based on what Joe Marie and Stefan has said, to understand as well that there's a psychological aspect mm -hmm. uh, to branding in general, but specific personal branding. And it, it can be very scary, right? Because you are putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not just a casual user of these tools anymore. I mean, anybody can start a social media platform or whatever platform um but when you are personal branding it's a, it's a it's an intent 
right? And then Joe Murray, Joe Murray said that there's an intention that you have or that you're trying to fulfill. But then the, psycho the psychology of it comes in, in, in that you're one, putting yourself out there, which means you're way more vulnerable, which is why cancel culture is actually a thing. You're, you're way more vulnerable, but then you're also, you're juggling that while juggling, trying to, in a, in a, in a word, convince people <laughs> that you are as talented or as skillful or, or, or um, as you say you are. And, and right. that can come into conflict with your own self. If you look at somebody like Michelle Obama, you know, you would think, oh, well, Michelle Obama is the first black um, president's wife. What do they call her? Pres first lady. Flotus. Flotus. <laughs> First lady, yes, first lady of the United States. <laughs> right, right. Now everybody loved Michelle Obama. She's elegant, she's well spoken, intelligent. And whether you're in America or not, as a black girl, you were rooting for her. You were like, yes, Michelle. Right? Now, when you read her book, Becoming, and you 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 hear that she struggled with, with imposter syndrome, yeah. that kind of takes you aback because you're going, what? Why would you, of all persons, have imposter syndrome? I mean, it's not like anything that we would have thought of you would not be true. She is highly educated. Uh, she is clearly intelligent. She, she, it's true. But when you are putting yourself out there, when you now become visible in the public space, and you are actually having to tow a certain line or having to, to carry a certain message, whether that message is about who you are as a brand, as a person, whatever, it becomes, it, it can affect you psychologically. So what Stefan says about, you know, you using the tool and not allowing the tool to use you and what Joe Marie said earlier about, you know, how people can be affected by social media. That's a conversation that comes up alongside any conversation about social media and branding. And it's about finding a balance where you can one clearly articulate and commun co communicate your message while still remaining authentic to yourself without telling everybody your whole business. <laughs> Right, because it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a delicate spot that you find yourself in. You don't want to. I, I know what Jo Marie wants me to know about her online. That's, a, that's psychology. She, she shows me only what she wants me to see. It doesn't mean she's being dishonest. It means that this is what she wants you to know about her brand, about herself. And that's something that you also have to understand, again, before you go online and say you won't do anything, you have to understand how do you um, make that balance. And it's, it's psychology, but also for security reasons. But I just wanted to throw that part um, out there as well. So when we're saying to you that you have to really put some thought into what are your intentions of putting yourself out there like this, because now what you're literally doing is stepping out of the crowd and stepping in front and say, here I am. Right. And there are things that accompanies that it's not all just pretty things and nice things and sitting on Caramac panel and looking pretty. There are things that come in that and there's a whole heap of hard work that comes with getting yourself here to where you're now being recognized for who you say you are and then being able to deliver on who you say you are as well. That's a whole other different conversation. Mm -hmm. right? and, and just to add, just, just uh -huh. a quick addition um, to that point, Kadeo, what you've really just described is the creation of boundaries. And mm -hmm. in creating those boundaries, I think that sometimes it's lost that you're, you're allowed to not tell people everything. You're allowed to actually just say, hey, all I wanted to know today is this and I'm not going any further. So it's very important to, in, in addition to that psychological work, to understand that you need to create boundaries. When when Kadia mentioned the the the, the Michelle Obama um, example, what I thought about is that limiting beliefs are the lies we tell ourselves, and a lot of us haven't actually found out what our truth is. And if we don't actually tackle what those limiting beliefs are, we're always going to be anchored to doubt. And so that's why for me, before we even build brand strategies, I want, I'm interested in Stefan. I want Stefan to give me some insight into his headspace because what is required of you to be intentional might very well unearth some very deep wounds or might put you in a position where this is not really what you signed up for. So it's very important that it's not just about understanding that, oh, this is what is required for me to personal brand. You are the real starting point. So mm. create those boundaries, understand who you are and what you want to be, and really tackle those psychological limitations you've placed on yourself. 
because you've been telling yourself some very limiting things, you know, and then you're coming on social media where people are going to confirm it for you. And then you're going to, st- and then that's going to register for you mentally that, you know what, sit there, I knew I couldn't do it. I knew, mm-hmm. I knew that I shouldn't have done this. And so before you even come on the platform, can you take the time to really assess and even the audit example that Stefan gave, which is which is essentially that finding kind of like a Venn diagram, you're finding that middle section. If you are not sure who you are, ask. Mm. Ask people who you trust. Ask yeah. people who, even people you don't know, because remember, you're branding mm-hmm. every day to not just your family and your friends, even people who you've just met. Just ask. Because it's better to be getting that sense of, confirmation from persons than you're going online because what's interesting is that there are introverts among the very extroverted people that you see and then you don't really understand which is what Kada was alluding to michelle obama would never have registered as somebody who has imposter syndrome but there are many people that are like her what they've managed to do though is that they've clearly found a space for themselves where they can inhabit be them true selves and go right back to where they want to be and that goes back to the point about boundaries which i mentioned earlier amen exactly i mean ultimately everybody have different facades different faces the way right dr prendergast um stefan what with all that being said and i just love the discussion so far rich you know there's some rich information coming forward what is a good starting point in establishing one's personal brand? Um, what do you want to get out of it? Uh, it, it? Because it starts with you, but going back to what I said in the opening statement, like what it is, is it that you want to be known? Is it, is it fame? Is it that you want um, your personal brand to lead to... Um, a big contract with some company? Is it that you want it to, um, you want to make money from some online website or some online platform? That's what, that's, 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 that's what it, that's what it starts with. And about creating a brand that is synonymous with that thing and, and makes people trust you enough to even, to, 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 to follow through with, um, giving you the things that adds value to your life as you, as you are adding value to their own life. Right. And again, you have a lot of people who are underusing social media, meaning they spend so much time on the platform, but beyond, and this is going back to the psychological that Katie mentioned, beyond the sensation of feeling good, right? Um, and we can go into social media addiction because you, you now have to spend more time to get the the, the, the equal amount of sensation that you would have gotten yesterday, right? Beyond feeling good, what does it do for you? What value does it add to make your life easier when you come off of it, right? That's where you need to start. Um, And the thing is, it's funny because we we spend, it's, 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 it's fascinating and it takes some resocialization that we spend more, we spend so much time doing the things that don't add anything to our lives. And the things that add or potentially can add so much to our lives, we spend very little time and we make so much excuses about it. Because I'm sure you have a lot of people listening who, who thought that when we talk about personal branding, we're talking about, hi guys, welcome to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And, and, and the best and the best type of ring light, like, like the ring light that I'm using now. I'm sure a lot of people thought that's what we were going to be talking about. That is a small part of it. The work that you don't see is behind the scenes when it comes to building, developing, and investing in yourself. And again, understanding what value can be gleaned from these spaces as you also add value to, to the lives of individuals. And even, even when we started... When we started um, our podcast, the Men's Shoot podcast, um, it was, and, 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 and although that's, a, uh, that's not, it's a brand separate from who we are, but we as hosts are very much tied into what it is. So it is very, still very much personal branding. And on that platform is, is a level of honesty and openness that is, 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 is reciprocated in a way that is unbelievable. We have people listening in in Nigeria, Russia, people we have never met who are saying that we are giving them something that they, they, they have not ever gotten or something that they have not 
thought about, right? And that's the value. What do we get back from it? We get back the sense that we can literally change or impact someone's life for, for the better, right? So it's not about money or anything else. No other projects, other activities that utilize the social media space might be about that. But that particular one is really just about the positive exchange of, of, of thoughts and beliefs to literally help um, the lives of individuals, which ties into my PhD work. But those are the things you need to understand or you need to start from what value can I get from this thing and what value can I um, add to the, the lives of, of the people who follow me or who we are in relationships with. I don't like the word follow. Who we are in relationships with, as Katie said, the communities we are building. Yeah, and, and when it comes to communities, a symbiotic relationship, mm, mm-hmm. what you just said, Stefan, is a, is a symbiotic relationship in that you are giving value and then in giving value, you're attracting value to yourself. Ah, absolutely. Because one thing that happens online that I am particularly happy about is that there are no gatekeepers as mm. such. And mm. what I mean is before, uh, we had art critics telling us what good art is and what good mm-hmm. art isn't right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or we had somebody who is a a, a quote-unquote expert or thought leader of high influence or in high regard or nobility tell us that this thing is good or this thing is bad. And and, and what happens when that happens is that we don't get to control our individual narratives. Mm -hmm. But when you go online and when you use tools like social media, now you can control uh, that narrative because there are no gatekeepers, but then somebody has to say what makes this thing good or mm-hmm. not good. And the somebody's is now your community, <laughs> right? Your community now decides if the content you are creating mm-hmm. and putting out there or the brand that you're um, communicating to them has value. And that is going to be highly dependent on how they feel um about the value you give them it's how you're reflecting to them or how, how they're reflecting how, how it goes there's this whole thing about the brand identity prism and they talk about reflection how you are reflecting to your audience and how that's bouncing back to you it's like a mirror right mm. so that that, that in, in that way it's 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 how the value you are creating attracts value to yourself and we can talk about you know brand alignment because it's not just projecting it's also um you, you talk about at, at, you know working with other brands right you have to make sure that the brand the brand image or identity you're putting out there is in alignment with any other brand or any other partnership or anything else that you 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 um, want to attract to yourself and that's where all of us have said it before it all comes back down to intention what is it that you are intending to do when you go and www.caterfrancis.com? What is the intention of doing this, right? How are you using these spaces to communicate that intention to people? And what are you attracting when you communicate that intention? So all of that has to be taken into consideration as well. So you, the, the value you give is going to be the value you attract. And another example of this is what we call thirst trap accounts. I don't know, Stefan, I know <laughs> John Marie will know what I'm talking about. When you look at thirst trap accounts on social media, you're talking mm-hmm. about accounts that tend to be provocative in the mm-hmm. content that they share. Uh, there's a certain uh, fluffy diva. Is it fluffy? No, not fluffy. There's a certain TV personality that we all know about who has over a million followers on a particular um, social media platform. But if you should look at the the type of comments under the content section, you'll be surprised because you think, oh, she has a million followers. That means that, you know, it's all good. It's all love. But you will find, and Joe Marie alluded to, you will find that people follow you on social media just to tell you how bad you are. Mm, People mm. follow you on social media just to tear you down. It, it's, it's a thing. It's, and it's no different yeah. from tra- traditional media spaces where they'll build you up to the highest heights and then in no time, they remove that from under you and everything come collapsing down. So again, you have, it's, it's, it's about the intention and the value that you're attracting based on what you're, you're putting out there. Having a lot of followers is not a good indicator of your value or the value that you're attracting. So that's one thing yeah. I, would, I, I, would, I would say as well. So you have to think, 
how best can I reflect myself to my audience? And your audience will reflect back to you in, in several ways. The fact that my audience shares my content, talks about me when I'm not in their faces, remember, remember something I would have said and can repeat it back to me or repeat it back to somebody or can recommend me to be on a panel like this or something is, is, is an indicator of the value that I'm giving to my audience and how my audience wants to see me and also where my audience wants to see me. Because you can start out on social media and end up in loftier spaces because that's where your audience wants to see you because of your perceived value to them. That's it. All right. So to you, Kalia, Yeah. what is the difference based on all that you have said? And I'm certain I see um, Dr. Pendergast nodding and so on. So I know he's in agreement. <laughs> what is the difference between branding for a commercial business as opposed to branding to become an influencer? As opposed to branding for? To become an influencer. Oh, Lord. Is there a difference between you started on influence your personal and your professional this brand? Is a, this is a, a, a sensitive spot for me. <laughs> All right. So the difference between when you say branding as a company, you mean how they brand themselves? Because right. when you are a business, right, your, the intention is clear. You want to sell more products and services. Clearly, that's what you're doing. But when you turn to the digital space uh, to do that, you're involving different tactics. It's about the tactics that you're using to reach the I'm not necessarily saying everything does posting. This is the price of this product. This is the product. Yeah. Right. Know? But mm. it, it, that's not the only way that you sell more products, certainly not online, you know, oh. the, depending, as, as, oh, as I yeah. said. Um, the, the beauty about social media is that you can customize your message for different audiences right you may be a business with several audiences right and in using social media you can customize your message and that's why people tend to uh use that platform but when you are an influencer and influencers tend to usually be personal brands when you're an influencer it's more about selling yourself uh or let me rephrase that positioning yourself as uh, a leader then Meaning that you can show that you have an audience that you command in certain ways, an audience that will listen to you. And we're coming right back around to authenticity again. If you can show to a commercial brand that, listen, if we were to partner and do something, I was to come to your hotel and take pictures because that's what that's that's how I see Jamaican people interpret influencer branding, which is I'm saying, please don't get me started on influencer marketing. Uh, we tend to, in Jamaica, interpret influencer marketing as coming to your place, taking pictures, and telling people how awesome your place is. That is not influencer marketing. <laughs> but it's really, in effect, positioning yourself mm. as being able to uh, influence the decision your audience makes. That is what an influencer does. An influencer marketing started long before digital. Don't think this is something about digital. If you look at it, when you talk about, when, when, you, use, when you say celebrities in commercials, you, you, you know, cover girls are all celebrities and Pantene and the hair and all of that. So influencer marketing did not start with social media. It's just that social media has taken it and turn it into something altogether. And that's why we say social media can be a kingmaker because then just by producing certain con certain pieces of content, you can, start the, the, you can start positioning yourself in a particular way that, that you become noticeable to certain brands. And when there's alignment between you and that brand, you can earn from your personal brand, yeah? But in, in, in essence, at its core, it's about um, positioning yourself to be able to influence how, uh, how your audience or your community, um, the decisions that they make about certain things. And that's what makes influencers, especially digital influencers, very powerful because they have the attention of a lot of people at the same time, instantaneously and for free, which was not always the case with traditional marketing. I mean, boundaries. You know. Media and digital platforms have made that possible. And I talk about this person all the time. Hi, Terry. Terry Carell is an example I can give of a super influencer 
who has transcended different media spaces, whether it's tra traditional media space or a, um, a digital media space. And it's because, again, she can command the attention of a particular audience. And she also has the ability to influence them in, in different ways. And she has, a, she has a tactic that she used that tends to play on the emotional aspect of it. That's kind of her, her shtick. Um, it's about the emotional connection that she can make with her audience. And that's also, that's, that's very powerful. But Terry is extremely strategic in, 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 in what she does and where she does it and what she says and how she puts herself um, out there. And if you're looking for a prime example of a Jamaican who's using the digital um, platforms to, to brand themselves very well, you look no further um, than, than Terry. There are several lessons that you can learn from her. In, in, in that regard. And I don't think she set out to be an influencer, but again, the value she attracts, that's the value she attracted to herself. Okay, she's kind of, how oh, does she differ from a spice or a B angel? You know, in terms There's no of difference. There's no difference. And this is, a, this is something I want to disabuse us of. It's about your audience. Uh, she has the same effect on her audience as Spice has as, on her audience as D'Angel has on her audience. No one audience is better. No one. It, it's not a matter of better or different. It's a matter of how they influence um, their, their audience or, or the value that, again, your community is the, the your community determines your value. Spice community determined her value. Terry Carell community determines her value. And that's why, whether you're talking about Spice, uh, Miss Kitty, the Curvy Diva, it doesn't matter who you're talking about. You have to look at what, the, what is it that they're, what is the messaging that they're putting out and how is, it, how is that reflecting? In fact, we can't even be here talking about them. It kind of shows the strength of their personal branding as well. Mm. Right, because in, in I mean, way, first of you bring call them. But what I don't want people to think is that there's any intrinsic difference between any of these persons in terms of um, the effect of their brand. It's just the audience is different, which is why the content is different. And it's your audience that determines the value because they're the ones that you want to um, influence a certain way. It's their perception that counts. So it's your audience. So don't think one is bad and one is good. That's not the case. It's just about, again, I think it's either Joe Marie. I think both of them have said it. What is your intention? What is the value you're giving? Are you being your authentic self? And how is your community reflecting that back to you? And I think all of these people have been successful in doing that. I don't think one is more successful than the other. All of them in their own way have been successful in doing that. Spice is an international artist. No, you can't take that from her. She's an exactly. international artist of yeah. note, right? Exactly. So of note. Girl is an so, international speaker of note. So in both ways, I think they've been successful. Exactly. Okay, so Jo Marie, mm -hmm. are the approaches for rebranding and branding for the first time different? Are there different approaches to branding as opposed to well, rebranding? Okay, so what I would say is that the intersection between rebranding and branding is really going back to that anchor. So let's say that, let's use the very real example of what Kida would have just mentioned, Spice. If it is that um, Spice, is, or better yet, a very real-life example is um, Lady Saw. When Lady Saw decided that she was going to, in her own personal decision, you know, she decided to fortify her walk with God, which resulted in a complete shift into Marion Hall and Minister Marion Hall. As Kada would have mentioned, that is her initial branding would have been successful. When you think of being a dancehall present and being a dancehall legend, Lady Saw is top five and not five, you know? But when she decided to become Minister Marion Hall, that rebrand required a complete shift because she could not, in the name of authenticity, still wear the same thing, still talk the same way, and still communicate. But guess what's interesting? I saw her perform at Unity in the City. This would have been two years ago. And what she, what you realize is that her branding was not dance hall or gospel. Her branding was energy. Her branding was influence. And her branding was her ability to communicate, whether it's the gospel or otherwise, 
I said that she was able to make people feel something. She was able to connect them on a very real level. So when you use that example, you realize that the difference is: can you still be authentic in that space if you are if 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 this is where you want to go? And that is why your why matters. She wanted to be Minister Marianne Hall. She had to put down certain things. When you're just starting out, it's a similar process. What are you trying to do in the name of authenticity that will allow you? to really stand in front of this audience, to really cultivate that sense of community without coming off as being disingenuous. Because it's not even just cancer culture, it's the fact that people are very perceptive. When I see Kadia in the supermarket, I need to be able to see the same person there that I'm seeing on Instagram. And I don't know if anybody has ever had this experience where you meet somebody, you know, who they're purporting to be this sweetheart, nice person. And when you see them in person, you're just like, hello, um, what is going on? And so Ellen it starts with, uh, mm, no, we can't start that conversation. No, 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 ma'am. No, ma'am. <laughs> okay, we're going to bring it back into the spirit. Okay. Um, so anywho, but, but yeah, so even Ellen's, even Ellen's situation, that is cancer culture. That is, there was, a, there was always a lack of authenticity, but guess what? When you've built a high enough tower, you can hide behind the authenticity until somebody removes it brick by brick. And that came from her staff. That came from people who are like, look, we're tired of this. People need to know. Because remember, her brand was, I'm giving away money from Shutterfly for this really cool dancer and this person who's trying to advance their creative career. And then you realize that her staff wasn't being paid properly. There was rampant racism and rampant classism. So then you realize that that lack of authenticity would have actually really put her in a position where she could no longer stand on that footing anymore. And it resulted in sponsorship being withdrawn. It resulted in people saying, but this is who we grew to know you as what has changed. And so whether you're starting or rebranding, authenticity has to be at the core. You have to go back to your why. You have to go back to what, what am I doing? Because a key, way to, a key way to look at it, or even simpler way to look at it is, if you cannot ask the same, if, if somebody has three, four, five different things to say about you, or rather, if what you're putting online, people in people who know you personally would just be like, girl, put it down. <laughs> that's a whole lie. No bother with that. If that's a problem, then you need to actually assess that because nobody ever wants that when you are, or, or, or even better, think about when you're not in a room, because that's real branding, you know, Right. I don't know, for example, how I ended up in the very privileged position to be on this panel or how I was even considered. But it happened in my absence. And so if you think about it, how you how are you positioning yourself for opportunities when you are not there? Are you telling the story that people want to hear? And I want to be very careful. The use of the word story is really connected to the notion that you're, you're telling people something on a consistent basis that has a narrative. Do not think that it is a lie. Do not think that there is some grand story. It is just that whoever I am showing up online would have reflected who I, or would have reflected what I wanted people to think um, whenever my name comes up. So always have it in the back of your mind. When you are absent, when you are not in that room, are you confident that if Stefan and Keda were to talk about me, what would they say? And another thing is, don't, there, some people have this notion where they're like, oh, I don't have to care about my reputation, but you do though. And here's why. Your reputation is honestly one of the things that, you, that impacts you the most, but you don't own, hmm. Right. So the fact that it impacts you the most, but you don't own it means that you actually have to care about it. Because if I had a reputation where I, as a speaker, I'm just like, excuse me, where is my water? I mean, it's a virtual event. I don't care. You guys need to send me water and whatever. If I had that reputation, for example, then I am already reducing the likelihood of ever being invited anywhere again. And should that matter to me? Yes. Because more than being on this panel, it is about how can I, with my God-given talents, impact and help people? And that matters to me. So it's, it's really how are you able to put those things together, whether you're rebranding, whether you're starting from scratch, how are you able to really assess those facets in a way that makes sense? Because trust me, 
your reputation matters. I know you know that fundamentally, but your reputation matters because that speaks for you when you're not around. And again, it's the one thing that impacts you the most that you have no control over. And even if you can control it, you're still at the, the, the mercy of people who might have gotten some sort of conflicting information about you. Because I can tell you, if I never met Kada before, and five people who I highly regard told me something contrary to what Kada is. It's not that I'm automatically going to write her off, you know. But I'm going to say, but these are five people who have no interest to serve about Kada. They don't know Kada from any, they don't, they don't know her to be speaking ill of her for no reason. And so it must be so inconsistent that when I'm now seeing her on this panel, I'm like, but how is it that these five people mm. have said this and I'm getting a different impression? So always bear in mind that you're still keeping that consistency and authenticity at the fore. Because when people think you are a fraud, and I need to explain that fraud does not just mean embezzlement and whatever. Personal branding fraud <laughs> is a very real problem that especially with all, especially when you think of influencers and when you think of what they're representing, there is a lot of fraud. But how are you? But that's not, but that's, that's, that's a much bigger issue. What you need to focus on, and if you remember nothing else, what you need to focus on is when I step on this stage, I need to be able to be confident in who I am, stand by what I'm standing by, my values must be intact, and that's it. Because when you know what those things are, no matter what, remember the C analogy I made earlier, whether you go into that C and you see money over here, you see fame over here, you see whatever, you will know exactly which water you're treading. Because if you decide that you're going to go off in the deep end and you want to be a part of this very, um, you want to be a part of this branding circle that is not, is not authentic. It's, there's no integrity. Everybody's just in it for whatever. You're going to find that you'll be more susceptible to cancer culture than anything else. So it's very important that you, you're anchored by those things. Amen. Sound words, sound advice. Uh, we are winding down a little bit on the discussion segment because the questions from our virtual, from our audience who are you know, in the virtual realm have started to pour in. So um, we're going to wrap this segment um, with asking each of you to answer the same question. What are your top three recommendations to amplify your brand identity or presence? So we are going to start with Kadia, then Jo Marie again, and then Stefan to close out. All right. My top three recommendations to amplify your brand identity, you said? Yes. Wow. Okay. Apart from what we have all said here today, you know, um, Stefan said it. Y'all thought we were going to come here and tell you about the best ring light to use. <laughs> right? So, uh, some, some persons are sitting there going, am I in the right session? <laughs> um, but apart from, apart from, you know, everything that we've said here about knowing, understanding your why, being intentional, you know, being authentic, build, I, I would say some of the things that you can do to amplify, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to speak from a personal um, point of view as to how, if you can find a way to decenter yourself, and this is going to sound odd, how do I decenter myself um, from the personal, from my personal brand? Uh, and how I have done it is to concentrate on the message. Um, I, I, I knew what it is that I wanted to do before I came into this space. I, I, I kind of knew the gaps I wanted to fill. And I decided that instead of focusing on me, Kada Francis, the person, it was about the message that I wanted to communicate and understanding the audience that I wanted to communicate it to. And I think that is how you decenter. Um, yourself from your personal brand while still being very much present um, in it. Um, and I would say that's probably um, a more powerful thing because then, yes, they know who you are, um, key difference, but I think that way they can understand better again or you can more effectively communicate uh, your why to them when you do it that way. But that was just my methods. And yes, it's because I'm an introvert. I will admit it's because I'm an introvert. 
<laughs> and I don't like being in front of the camera. That certainly played a part. But I found that for me and for what I was trying to do, that was very um, effective. So how you communicate your message, I guess in a nutshell is what I'm trying to say, how you communicate your message and how you center yourself in that message is very important and can help you amplify um, that message. Um, that's one. The other thing I will say is focus as well on your community, um, specifically developing your um, community as well, because your community can get you further than your own efforts can actually get you, right? There's only so much you can do online and there's only so much um, reach you can get without your community behind you, uh, pushing you. And uh, the example I'm going to give is actually of Jo Marie. Jo Marie actually has a very lively community on Twitter. And, uh, uh, and even though she's present on different platforms, it's obvious that her tribe is on Twitter. The level of engagement is different. The, the communication is different. How she puts across her messages um, it, it's, it's also different. So I can see that Jomiri has put effort into cultivating a community um, on that platform. And, and it's obvious, it, it, and you can, you can see it um, in, in, in her follow account, but also in her engagement. And you can know when somebody is successfully cultivating a community because their engagement rate is commensurate with their follower account. But that's something you have to pay for if you want to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> that's paid information. Okay. Um, um, so you can know when somebody is successful in that. And um, the third thing I would say is make sure that you're being consistent. Um, that's, it's very important that you be consistent. Joe Marie said it, the same person in the supermarket should be the same person that comes on here and go, hi guys, like, and subscribe my YouTube channel as Stefan says, <laughs> right? It's that, it, it, it's that same person because, you know, you never know who is watching. Mm -hmm. You never know. Stefan says his podcast reach all the way to Russia. You never know who's listening who's watching and sometimes people recognize you before, you know, you, you're out. In, I remember the first time somebody says, hey, Digital Jamaica. And I was like, oh my God, I have friends, <laughs> <laughs> right? I was somewhere and I was talking about, I was supposed to be talking about the podcast, Digital Jamaica podcast, Shameless, shameless Plug. And um, they were introducing me and I go, uh, KD Francis, Digital Jamaica. No, there was no woo for KD Francis, but there was a woo for Digital Jamaica <laughs> podcast. And I was like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it, it, you, you don't know who's watching. You don't know who's listening. You don't know who's being impacted by what you do and, 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 and connecting with you on that level. And it's an absolute letdown and disappointment when you find that the person you would have connected with um, in this space and sometimes connecting on a personal level, because sometimes some of the things you say, you're just saying it, but somebody take it. So it, it means something to them so deeply. Again, I'll give you the example of Michelle Obama. There are several things that she has said. I was like, yeah, that touched my heart. I touch my heart, right? I, I don't know her from anywhere. When, when Chadwick Boseman, um, Bos Boswick died, I cried. It, it sounds weird. But for whatever reason, Black Panther affected me in a different kind of way, right? And I felt that there was some kind of connection there when this person passed. It was like, it, it broke that connection. It's the absolute same thing that happens when you're putting your personal brand out there. Inadvertently, what you're doing is you're making connections with people that you will never meet. Some of them, most of them you will never meet and you don't know that they're watching you. So try and be as authentic as possible and be consistent in that regard. So you're, you're not disappointing um, your audience unnecessarily um, so. Because um, mm -hmm. again, once that trust is broken, you may never get it back. And that could be the ruination of your, the brand that you spent and expended so much effort um, in building. So that one bad day that you have on somebody come to you, go, not today. And you have an attitude with them. Yeah, that could, that could cause everything to, to collapse. So you have to make sure that you're consistent in that regard. Yeah. Okay, thank you. John Marie, what are your three um, recommendations? So I would start with 
in order to amplify, you have to know what you're saying. And you have to know, um, I, I want to impress upon you that amplification is really just making you louder. So you need to understand you first. We've said that at length today, but I just want to, that's my starting point. And here is why. When you step onto social media, you're stepping onto social media, whether you're in a sea of same or you're a disruptor. And it's much better to be a disruptor in the context of you're differentiating and you're setting yourself apart because you'd have to work. You won't have to work as hard to get into where you need to get to because you've been very clear about who you are. So again, I don't know if you picked up, but I love analogies. I think they help, you know, to sell things a little better. So let's start with the notion. So the first thing is really that foundation, right? The foundation is a self-work and that self-work can take many different steps because whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, like when I tell people I'm an introvert, they're like, ah, whatever. And they're like, every single thing you do is public, is public facing. I said, yes, because I, you don't understand what it takes to get here. Okay. It takes a little, you know, takes a little time. But anyways, um, so you need to understand who you are. Even that, knowing that you're an introvert, extrovert, ambivert, that kind of information is powerful because there are other people who are just out there like you. So if you started your whatever content or whatever positioning you're trying to do, and you're like, hey, guys, honestly, I'm just on this journey trying to figure out myself, you will find your tribe that is very much like, okay, we're just all trying to figure it out too. Happy to see that we're not alone. Thank you so much for telling us this information. So try and find out more about you. And I'm not just talking about your profession. Stefan said it so perfectly. We were always at what we wanted to do and not who we wanted to become. So I am really set on you figuring out who you are. And that cannot happen while you're online. It meaning if you go online, you will find out certain things about yourself. But that if you want to reduce the chances of really putting yourself into problems, start offline. Certain practical things you can do, do a personality assessment. No, a lot of people are like, oh, but that's very hairy fair. No. I learned that what connects everything I do is communication. So at first, I was like, brand strategy, lawyer, motivate. What communication was a connection? And by understanding that, I realized that if communication is my superpower and communication is my zone of genius, then I should never not be doing that. Because especially if you're a multi-hyphenate, you have to get clear about what is your superpower and what do you bring to the table. You will come and you will tell me that you're a lawyer, doctor, Indian chief, and then I'm so confused. Because especially in this society, we are more, we're more ready to follow somebody we, when we can readily say, okay, this person is a lecturer, this person is a campus director. But when I get to know um, Ms. Brown, and when I get to know Mr. Pendergrass, then I will say, oh, he's also into these things. She's also into these things. So start with that self-work, gain clarity. And then the second thing I would say is finding your niche. Now, niche work oftentimes is misconstrued as you are limiting yourself. No, you are not. When you find your niche, actually what you're doing is you're saying, okay, in this sea of same, in this foundation that I'm building, how can I create some sort of distinction so that I'm able to really just step into this space? Being a lawyer and a brand strategist, I didn't think that was anything to really mention. Because if you know me, I'm the last person to mention anything I'm doing. I'm just Joe Marie, Joe to some, Joe to most. I'm not trying to be seen. But somebody said to me, they're like, Joe, that's not, come on, come on. Now you have to tell people. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, all right, I guess. But you find that those things that you take for granted that you don't think are relevant to state, find the people in your circle who can come and tell you, you know, honestly, Stefan, I really think that you're good at X, Y, and Z. And I think you need to pursue it. Because guess what? And never forget, there's a T.D. Jakes um, comment where he said, he was standing on the pulpit and he said that, hey, you know, the only person I can't see in this room is myself. And that's why it's so important to have people around you who can pour into you and say, no, man, you're building this personal brand. You're serious about it now, but you have a blind spot. And this is actually where your zone of genius lies. And in case you're not familiar with what a zone of genius is, your zone of genius is a thing that you do really well and you probably don't exert that much effort. But you don't think of it as anything because society has kind of told you that, oh, that's not something to phone home about. So it's very important that you tap into that. So again, start with the self-work, find your niche. And the third thing is to understand that the more focused you are, the more powerful you are. So remember that analogy that I've been working on. So we have the foundation of the house, now we have the rooms, right? Understand that just like your bedroom, your bathroom, your living room don't perform the same function, it's the same thing with social media. 
So whichever room you're deciding to step into, you need to show up in that context or you need to decide, is this the room I need to be in? So I really want to, I really want you to let go of this notion that you have to be on every single platform. Because the truth is, you, there are at least eight platforms now. If you're going to include Clubhouse and TikTok, there are at least eight platforms now, right? You don't need to be on all. This might be a controversial take. I'm here to take all the controversy with you, okay? You don't need to be on all of them because here's the truth. If you're a serious content creator, you have to be consistent. And consistency is relative, but you must show up on these platforms if you're going to get what you need to get from them. So I would recommend that after you've done the self-work and you've built the foundation and you've gained that clarity, you now know which room you need to go into. So maybe the only room you need to go into is Twitter. Because as Kadia mentioned, I didn't set out to do anything great on Twitter. And then when people are like, so where's the brand audit? I'm like, guys, this was a buck up thing. Like I wasn't trying to make this a thing. But another part of it is listen to your community. Because when that brand audit thing started, it really was a buck up thing. Like I think people think I'm joking. It was a buck up thing. But my community said, we want that. And as a result, one, it wasn't, in, it wasn't in conflict with my integrity or my values. And so it was actually something that would have been a blind spot for me because I thought that that was a simple thing, but so many people got value from it. So ultimately, you're chasing value, not vanity metrics, right? And it's very important for you to know that. So if you're going to know, amplify all of this, you have gotten clear on who you are, you've gotten clear on what you bring to the table. And also, please somewhere in your bio on these platforms please tell me why i should care because it's not implied don't mm. take it for granted that people know why they should care about joe marie like i you have to start from an assumption that actually nobody cares but you are going to make them care because you have something of value to bring to the table so please ensure that in all of your amplification efforts you are clear on why i should care and that can take the form of a one-liner that says, I help a certain group of people to accomplish a certain outcome by doing this. If you follow that template, you find your one-liner, you pretty much can communicate. That's, that's an elevator pitch that's clarifying for people who don't get it. And it also gives you, the person, the confidence to say, hey, I help introverted professionals build a dynamic personal brand online. Versus I'm a brand strategist which does not create any line of distinction for you in your mind, but you hear the words introverted, you're professionals, you're like, oh, this is where she, this is her zone of genius, this is her space. So those are the three things that I just wanted to emphasize because again, I'm, I do not believe in amplification without clarity because amplification without clarity equals confusion, which you don't want, right? Yeah. Okay then, Stefan. Jeez, you see, you see, this is why it's, this is why it's good to listen to introverts, you know, because I'm also an introvert. You see, we have an, a very introverted panel. And the thing about introverts, we don't waste words. So just listening to Joe Marie and Katie a while ago, I I I it it I, I I became a student once more because I'm paying attention to all these things. But if I had to leave three things in terms of amplifying your 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 personal brand, three R's. Uh, and the first R is read. Uh, it's in social media, you find the most people, what's the saying? Empty bars make the most noise. The people who promulgate the conspiracy theories or talk the loudest about certain things, they don't have the evidence to support it, right? And it's good to actually refuel and to have valid information and valid data for the things that you believe in. So read. A lot of people don't like to read that something about our culture we need to change. You might think it's too much work, but the more evidence or the more data that you have to build on, it makes the creation of your brand a lot easier. The second R is to reflect. We are bombarded by data and information all around us. The, you, you, Joe Marie spoke about the, 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 the eight major social media platforms. It's not just, so it's not just those. You have the Netflix, you have the whatever, you have all of this information that leaves very little room for you to reconnect with that silent voice in your mind. I wake up at 4.30 every morning. Before I even talk to anybody or read anything, I spend 15 minutes just thinking. Let your mind go where it needs to go because that is part of the recalibration process continually reminding yourself who you are and who you would like to be before you even talk to anybody else, before you even decide that 
this is the people that you want to have an impact on. You need to know who you are. And reflection is of utmost importance. And once you start with that, and it's not, it's, 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 it's not something that's, that, that's easy, but it is valuable, right? So read, reflect, and, you know, I could suggest some books that can help you with these processes because we're not just saying these things off the top of our heads. We have had the experience, um, each of us, um, that is supported by, 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 by books and sources and all of these things. And the final R is to respond. Not just respond to your community and the, and the sentiments they, ha they have, but also to the environment and what makes you more valuable, what, 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 what contributes to your personal development. You know, as Caramac students and, 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 and staff, you know, we talk about the definition of development. Development constitutes the reciprocal relationship between people and their environment, which leads to the actualization of your fullest potential and the preservation of, 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 of the environment for future generations. So what is your fullest potential and how do you get there? So after you've gotten all of this information, knowledge is not power. The application of knowledge is power. So after you've gotten all of this information and all of this knowledge, how do you respond to your environment, physical environment or the digital environment, to ensure that not just the development of your personal brand, but the development of who you are as a person? Okay, questions for all of us to ponder, pointers for all of us to ponder. I mean, I'm an introvert as well, Stefan. Can I believe it? I, mean, <laughs> I don't believe it. It took a lot out of me. But when I saw the branding done by the G14, as I call them, trust me, it was impeccable. Sure. I couldn't say no. It was so professionally done. Absolutely. Trust me, Dr. Baker, these students deserve the A. And, and yes, it is not just about the grade. It is clearly what they have learned and have, and have applied. After mm -hmm. such an information-filled discussion, enabled, no doubt, by the, question, the questions curated by the students, because all the questions I posed were set by the students. Can you believe it? They weren't my questions at all. Understand? They did, a, they did a, pretty, um, a pretty good job, surpassed my expectation because exactly. I can tell you, I mean, this you is get the invited on these panels to talk about social media and branding and the conversation is usually very surface. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised at how deep mm. we've gone into exactly. it. I'm, 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 so <laughs> I'm so proud of them. And guess what? The questions I've been pouring in. Um, from the audience as well, we're in the virtual realm. So we're just going to get straight into the question and answer segment. We can only take a few and then we'll go into the giveaway. I mean, the students have also, you know, secured some really nice prizes for giveaways. So let me just go ahead and, and um, um, access the questions in the chat and um, put them to our panelists. Uh, question one. How can you increase brand recognition without stifling your customers? Does that make sense to you? How can you increase your increase brand recognition without stifling your customers? Uh, if if by without stifling your customers, if, if by stifling you actually mean annoying uh, 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 your customers, Jo Marie just said it. You don't have to be everywhere. Uh, you just have to make sure that you're in the right places. Mm. Uh, so if you just heard what Jamari said, and I, I don't know how many gems she dropped in that one, but if, if you don't take away anything else, that, that controversial bit, Jamari, I'm willing to jump on that on, um, in that ring with you. Um, yeah, because you don't have to be on every platform. And she's absolutely right by that. You see, this is, this is another thing um, that I want people to understand. When you're going to go online, especially if you're if you're concentrating your personal branding efforts on online, it's, it's the easiest, most accessible way of doing it these days, right? You have to first understand the technicalities that are involved in doing this, and one of the technicalities um, um, is, is having to do with how you distribute your message, the channels 
um, that you use to distribute your message and understanding that you select those channels based on how your audience um, uses the online space. So if you find that your audience usually congregates at Facebook after seven o'clock, after the news, right? That's when your content needs to be out there. Um, that's when you need to be that you, you need to be increasing your engagement and your activities because that's when you know you can reach them. In that way, you maintain your visibility while not overwhelming or annoying or frustrating um, your audience because you have to understand as well, especially if you're a business, social media is exactly what the word says. It's a social space which means that people don't expect to come on social media to hear cash for gold. And this is an analogy I use all the time. Cash for gold, cash for gold, cash for gold. Is that you, you imagine yourself in a very nice restaurant. You're dressed to the nines. You're looking fabulous, right? And in walks the cash for gold man come around to your table to say, can I buy that nice necklace off the lady? Right? It's going to change your perception of that restaurant, isn't it? Um, it's going to change your experience. So when you're talking about social media, you're talking a more, a more softer approach to your messaging and to reaching and to communicating with your audience. So instead of um, taking that hard sell, where as you said, Susan, you're putting up your pricing, you're putting up, instead of doing that, in, 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 you're communicating your messaging in different ways. And you have, um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm putting together a, a, a training module today and I was looking at Jamaican commercials and how uh, the people who use commercials in Jamaica, how they appeal to their Jamaican audience. And I came across a Tasty commercial and the commercial was talking about how long Tasty has been around, you know, and they're showing you different scenes, the children after school eating the patty and the lunch counter and the lady at the airport with our patty box, <laughs> right? Traveling with our patty boxes. And so so it, it is, it's nostalgia, one, you, you're connecting with them experientially. You're saying we're all Jamaicans, we understand what this thing symbolizes and what this thing means is the same thing you're doing on social media, except you're being more strategic about where mm -hmm. you place that messaging and how yeah. your audience sees it. Another thing too is to try and avoid content fatigue, which means that you're posting this. So you decide that you want to be on every platform. And because we all know that content is making content is hard. It is not hard. easy the content and be consistent with the quality of that content you tend to find that people put the same piece of content on twitter facebook instagram it's the same oh, content so at every touch point mm -hmm. every digital touch point is the same messaging that they get that can also cause um frustration so yeah. when you're more selective with where you put that messaging and how you communicate that messaging and then differentiate for different audience on different platforms I think that's the best way of avoiding that. Okay. Another, another quick addition to that, Kadia, is the fact that it might just be the very simple reality that you're speaking to the wrong people. Yeah. Because a lot of people, when you ask them to do an assessment of their target audience, they're like, you know, man, woman, people on the earth, which is not targeted. <laughs> so what tends to happen is you're amplifying and talking, talking, talking. But when you find your audience, they're not annoyed. But they want to see you. The real people who are not are the people who they don't want to see you. But you keep talking to them. It's like, think about when you're, think about when, as, as you said, even the cash for gold analogy. Let's go a step further. The person just not leaving. Like they just, you see them on Twitter. You see them on Twitter. You're just like, hello. Like you haven't gotten the clue. And so that social aspect of social media, as Katie mentioned, is that you also, remember the whole two ears, one mouth thing, where you listen, you're supposed to listen more than you speak. It's very important you listen to your audience. It's not a static thing. Like, don't just schedule content and be like, I'm out. You mm. have to understand that who you're talking to, they're responding to. And some people are very direct. One of the key things I think everybody has agreed on in terms of the context of stifling customers is why am I DMing for price? Like, is it that when I DM for price, it's different if Stefan DMs versus Katie? Like, why would the price <laughs> just go there? 
because you've yeah. not you've not taken the time to think about customer delight. You've decided mm. that hey, I have a bag to sell. I'm gonna sell this bag. I'm just gonna tell you some random information out about the bag because you have nobody in mind. But let's say you're selling a beach bag and you're selling that to somebody who lives in Jamaica. You need to be able to. You have to play that up because most Jamaicans have a bag that they carry to the beach as a beach bag. If you understand the distinction. So if you're going to be selling this as a product, you need to be like, yeah, guys, that beach day, you know, when pandemic over, you have to start appealing to them. <laughs> Find that a lot of the times that stifling sense or that sense of being stifled comes from you're not to, you're not talking to me I want to be spoken to, and you're also not talking to the right person. And no matter how many times I've told you that I don't want you to talk to me you're still talking, which means that you're not being agile in how you communicate. You're being very much, well, the, the experts have told me to come on Twitter. I am on Twitter. But you're a highly visual business. Why are you on Twitter? What are you going to tell me in 208 characters? Unless you're like a copywriter extraordinaire and your ability to give me experiential copy is like on a thousand. Even then, nobody comes on Twitter for visuals. We go on Instagram for that. We go even video content, like, understanding that there are different mechanisms and ways for you to, to 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 reduce that amount of information that you have to do you might have to just do one good video and circulate that because we're not reading we're not doing we're not like the attention span on social media is extremely short and you have to go into the social media space knowing that so if you're going to try and get people's attention without stifling them without annoying them you need to be so clear on your message so precise and know that hey that one minute is really one minute and technically, mm. if you could get it down to 30 seconds, that would be even better. Because then you leave them wanting more, and then it reduces the chances that they're bombarded by whatever you have to sell them. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, another question coming from our audience. I have a relatively small YouTube channel, and I find myself always rebranding. How do I really know that my brand is a solid one? Well, I if, think if you're I, constantly rebranding, that should tell you. Ah. <laughs> I guess I want to know when, 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 how do they know when they get to the point where the brand becomes solid? I solidified. Oh, I'm hoping they would have been listening to us from the beginning because they're actually doing it in reverse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. As Jo Marie, Jo Marie, you know what? I'm going to concede this to you because I think Jo Marie said it when she talked about your why. And understanding that before you even go online. So I'm going to concede that to, to Jo Marie to respond. Um, well, thank you so much, Katie. I'm going to get my thoughts together and hope for the best. <laughs> um, the truth is, and, I, and whoever that person is, I'm talking directly to you. I'm here to tell you some hard truths. And it's not to scare you or intimidate you, but it's to give you some context. YouTube is a beast, mm -hmm. right? And when I say YouTube is a beast, YouTube, the, what is required to be successful on YouTube is a lot more back-end work than even, I don't think Stephanie is ever going to live down the like, comment, share, subscribe, so I'm just going to throw it back out there, right? <laughs> cool. It's much more than that. That's the, that's the end product. That is you, you've gotten the ring light, you've gotten your microphone, you've shot the video. No. What I want you to think about is, why are you doing YouTube? Because... You see, since the pandemic, there's been an influx of YouTubers, and I'm not in any way suggesting that you're just jumping on the bandwagon. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I've seen an influx of YouTubers, and because of the space I'm in, I pay attention because I'm like, okay, I'm a student of the things that I want to eventually do, or I want to, you know, figure out what goes into it. And I'm being friends with somebody who is a very popular YouTuber has given me even greater insight because I realized that what you are seeing on the back end is nothing or on the mm -hmm. front end is nothing. So mm -hmm. I want to start with why are you on this platform? Let's say that during the pandemic, you decided that, hey, depending on what your channel is geared towards. So let's take that you're a makeup um, artist and you're using this as an avenue for you to amplify your brand. Do not watch the vanity metrics of YouTube. They're very, they will be very disheartening. But if mm. one person shows up for your video, be so, like that one person should get the same vibe as if it's a million. 
Because mm-hmm. when you can really value that one person, you know, guess what will happen? Yo, you know, Stefan, I, I, there's this person on YouTube, you know, you have to check them out. That one person going to become two. And by the time you get to a thousand, or by the time you get to that monetized vibe, you know, that's usually the aim and the goal. By the time you get there, you're, you would have built up such a such fortitude. But constant rebranding, I'm here to tell you, is an, actually a byproduct of lack of focus or not mm-hmm. a big enough why or lack of clarity. So if your mm-hmm. question is when to stop rebranding, it's actually let's stop. Let's assess why we're doing this. Let's determine what is the best way. And let's actually take one of the hours from Stefan and let's read. YouTube, there are several YouTubers who actually teach you how to do YouTube or teach you what is the best way to put your brand on YouTube. Because again, it's not as social as your other platforms. Mm -hmm. People are required to show up in a way that they are not being asked to require. It's a commitment, actually. I can casually follow Kadia and Kadia post our nice things and I just see it casually. YouTube requires me to leave an ecosystem that I'm accustomed to, come over here, I might click subscribe, I might click like, but the reality mm. is that it requires a lot more work from me. So guess what? You make that work easy for me. You actually make me want to stay because I am clear on who you are. I, as a consumer, I like, I can tell when you're just like, yo, I'm just here to talk. Let's say you are here to talk about water bottles. Water bottles is probably the most like, nobody here to talk about water bottles, but guess what? You're passionate about water bottles. But your passion will I'll, will say, okay, when I need to get information about water bottles, guess where I'm going? You. So let's mm. niche down a bit and find out what is it that you can talk about with such a command of, of authority and passion that I automatically know that, yeah, man, when I have this in mind, this is the person I need to go to. But trust me when I tell you that you might need to just, as, as Stefan would have mentioned, that reflection time, really go back to what even sparked the idea to go back on YouTube and see if you're still congruent with that idea. Because you mm. may be rocking back and forth or vacillating between this concept of, okay, my brand is here, my brand is here, because you haven't found your anchor yet. So when yeah. you find your anchor, you can definitely say, okay, I'm going on YouTube, but I'm telling you, whatever platform you go on, know that it comes with its own level of difficulties and challenges. And it's not to defeat you, because the fact that there are people with millions of subscribers means that it can be done. It's mm-hmm. just that you're playing a different sport altogether. Like it's chess over checkers over there, but yeah, again, I, mean, uh, I want it to be. I want it to be inspired and motivated, and to focus on the fact that when you actually step into that space, you are going to know take it from a. You're, you're now going to take it from a, from a, a more informed perspective. And lastly, please let go of vanity metrics. Mm. I might be one of those controversial people who are like, oh, yeah, man, that it does not matter in the grand scheme of things. I'm going to give you a real life example. There was a girl who had 36 million followers. She started a T-shirt line. She could not sell 50 of them. Mm. Mm. Okay. Because mm. as Katie mentioned earlier, your community is not just a group of people who decided to be here. Some of them are here to see you fail. Mm. When you think of mm-hmm. people who, when they put things out to sell, you know, and they're selling out in two minutes, they never got there overnight. They cultivated relationships. They mm-hmm. said, hey, come over to my YouTube channel. We're going to sit down and talk. And if it's just me and you talking, I'm going to show up with the same energy as if it's me and a million people talking. Because guess what? Us as your audience can see whether or not you're passionate about it. And you see, if you drop the ball, we're going to drop the ball with you. So it's very important that you stay grounded in the reality of what you're getting yourself into, but you're still motivated and fired up because there must have been a why that made you say, let me get this account and let me start. So that's what I would recommend. Before we move off of that question, a couple of technical things that you also need to consider. One, YouTube is not a social media platform. YouTube is a search engine. It's a part of the whole Google ecosystem. It's the video aspect of that search engine ecosystem. That's one thing you need to understand, which means you can't treat it like how you would treat a regular mm-hmm. right. social media platforms, even though it have elements of other oh, social, social media yeah. platforms. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's one thing you need to understand. And that is why it is hard to be successful on YouTube. YouTube has over 5 billion videos or something to that effect. Um, um, so you're also competing with that much, um, content too. The algorithm is ridiculous, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is why when Joe Marie said, don't watch metrics, vanity metrics, don't watch vanity metrics because the YouTube algorithm is 
unpredictable. It changes very often. And it, it can be, it, it literally, you see these people that are teaching you how to use YouTube, they're not, most of them not giving you really much information because it's a science. And I'm right. not even kidding. It's a science working out how YouTube work and how you can use Google AdSense to make money off of YouTube. So that's something that you need to really pay attention to and really figure out if YouTube is the best place, again, for you to distribute your content. Mm. Another technical thing that I want you to understand um, about the YouTube platform too is that John Marie said that you need to know why you're doing it and kind of pick a niche. There are different ways of communicating that same message, right? You'll find that you have people, there's a lot of uh, what they call true crime, for example, channels on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. FBI files, true detectives, a lot of uh, um, true um, real life crime documentaries on YouTube. But you have different ways of telling that same story. If you go and you type in Ted Bundy, you can find 5 million videos telling you about Ted Bundy and the 5 million them telling you about Ted Bundy in 5 million different ways. You, meaning you don't, have to, you don't have to stick to just one way of telling a story. Right. Meaning you, yeah. your problem may be how you're telling that story and instead of rebranding, you may just need to shift how you're telling a story. It may just be that you're doing a video essay and I'll give you an example. In that same true crime uh, genre on YouTube, which is a huge popular genre, you have niches within that, within that genre. So you have ladies who they do um, makeup and crime or, or something to that effect. So what they do is while they're doing their makeup and they're giving you a makeup tutorial, they're telling you a story about a crime. Oh, wow. <laughs> And you're laughing, but these, these people have millions of followers on their platform. So you're getting a twofer, a makeup tutorial where she's slaying her makeup and she's telling about some gruesome crime uh, that happened. So that's one niche within a niche. Mm -hmm. And next way they do it is they do what they call a, a video essay where they're giving you the site is usually the psychology behind the crime where they're talking about how the person grew up and what the psychology is and how they're being interrogated by the police. And even within that genre, there's a separate genre that only looks at interrogations. You see where I'm going? It's inception, okay? <laughs> With these kind of things. So you have to, you have to know, and John said it, what are, how are you most comfortable delivering your content? So if you can find that and you can grab onto that and create the content in that format or that style, you will have a better time or easier time um, on YouTube as well. And also you have to understand when is the best time to post your content on YouTube. YouTube, even though it's not a social media platform, it operates similarly in that the algorithm will reward you if you're doing certain things correctly. Mm -hmm. So that's how you end up being recommended to people. And it also looks at how your audience is what, you're, what they're viewing on YouTube. YouTube is very much intent on giving you what you want to see. So if you're watching a certain amount of things over a certain period of time, your YouTube is going to flood your recommendations with similar pieces of content to what you are used to seeing on the platform or what you're engaging with the most on that platform. So if you understand your audience and understand what, how your audience is engaging in the type of content they're engaging with on YouTube and you're making the content and you're using the right keywords, because again, remember it's a search engine. So keywords, SEO plays a major part in getting your yeah. videos seen on YouTube. If you understand those little technical bits and you can position yourself the right way, you will see incremental but steady growth on YouTube. Because listen to me, YouTube is a full-time job. Full -time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair and enough. you actually might just need, you might need to just repurpose your, because I've seen this happen where you have a YouTuber who they're trying to grow their content. They're not sure whether or not their content is resonating and they've taken the same videos and put it on TikTok and seen greater reach. So yeah. to, to back Kadia's point, it might be that it's just where you're putting it, the way in which you're putting it. And so, and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm happy you mentioned the, or alluded to rather the notion of just trying. A lot of us need to understand that content creation is an ongoing experiment because 
Nobody anticipated Clubhouse unless you were in the space. Clubhouse is an introvert dream, okay? I just need to talk. You don't have to see my face. I just have to show up. But even then, that actually requires you to, you're still required to do a certain level of preparation for that. But it allows you to show up in the way that you would want to show up. So I would also recommend that maybe you repurpose your content and test it somewhere else and see yes. if that might be, because that will actually give you even greater insight so that maybe it's the length of your videos. Because again, you're playing with short attention spans. On average, people are not trying to see more than 10 minutes at any given time because TikTok has made it even. The fact that you get so much in one minute, you're realizing that the audience you're speaking to now, they are very much accustomed to one minute, get impact and gone. So that's also mm -hmm. something to bear in mind. I thank you very much for that. I'm certain that the audience member is appreciative. I mean, a lot of information there. I mean, pointed information that can take you someplace. Um, just to wrap up this segment, one final question um, from someone in the audience. Uh, what is the best strategy to stay relevant in an evolving market with lots of competitors? If we can just make the answer a rather brief what is the best strategy to stay relevant in an evolving market with lots of competitors and then we move right into our giveaway i'm pretty much close out so we're winding down uh, start, with, start with that clarity and once you get that clarity then you're good start with the clarity of your message find the people who would actually care about that message and then from there what you're going to do is you're going to stay or keep your ear to the ground about the developments in your space. So don't think that the approach that's working today is going to work tomorrow. So that is why whenever giving advice about strategy, my caveat or my disclaimer is that that strategy is relevant for the time based on the information available. So based on the information available, you'll know who the people are and you'll know how you need to talk to them. But understand that that might shift at any time. But if you're clear on who you are, you'll be able to make that shift easier than if you weren't sure and it just, and it, and it makes it very confusing. Uh, strategy, in, in terms of staying um, relevant, everything for me comes back down to the community because it's your community who decides your relevance. Um, and once you have the attention of your community and the trust of your community, then in some ways you will always be relevant um, to that community, especially if you're remaining consistent with your messaging and your content. But something that I have tried that I've seen work is fill some fill gaps, find out where the gaps are. And this is what we call doing gap, what we call doing gap analysis. Find out where the gaps are between you and your competitor and try to see if you can uh, fill those gaps in a meaningful way as long as it aligns with your brand. So I'm not saying to go off brand and try to do something completely different, but once it aligns with what it is that you are intending to do with your messaging and once you're into something that you think would add value to your community, try to see how best you can fill those gaps because a, a number of things happen um, when you do that. One, you expand yourself um, and, and expand yourself, meaning you become more relevant to people now because, oh, well, I know this person for this thing, but, oh, this person also does this thing and that thing and that thing and all of that aligns and it, it doesn't seem like it's a departure from, from that initial thing that attracted them to you in the first place. So that's important. But it, it's just almost a, an, an, a continuation or, again, as I said, an expansion up, up, on, up, up on that thing. And that's pretty much what I've actually done with Digital Jamaica. And I say we're gap fillers because we look for where our, where our audiences are, where are, they, where are they not being served, and we try to serve them um, in that area in conformity with what the Digital Jamaica brand already is or what we want to be, because as Joe Marie says, it's something that's evolved. You will hit several growth phases, is what I call them. And at each growth phase, your strategy needs to evolve. So you can get to that next growth phase and the next growth phase and the next. So you keep evolving your strategy um, with that. And once you're, 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 you're putting your community at the center of it and making sure that wh whatever way or direction you go, you're considering them and you're, you're, you're taking them along with you, I think you will always uh, stay relevant and, and um, to, to that group of people. Okay. If I could.
if I could, if yeah. I could add, in terms of in terms of the strategy of staying relevant, we need to. Yeah, I think the platforms that we use now, we've deemed them as sacred cows. Like we have to be on certain platforms and we have to be relevant on these platforms. The reality is there's always going to be something new. So if you and uh, you need to consider staying relevant um, and and making some room between you and your competitors might be on a newer platform that the majority of the population has not yet gravitated to, right? Because think about it. You enter early, and it's, and it's also an investment strategy. You enter early, you become the authority. That level of relevance, people will be looking towards you. So when the late adopters come on, you have created a, 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 a space where, where, where although there's competition, you are still deemed as one of those, the, the, the influencers, the top tier and all of those things. There is, and I think the good thing about, uh, about where we are positioned in the Caribbean is that we are able to look at North America, Europe, and all of these spaces with new platforms and are able to jump on, uh, are able to jump on it after there is some level of acknowledgement, but not enough. So there's this new concept of NFTs that's, that's blowing up now, right? non-fungible tokens where you, yep, where you where, where, where a regular Instagram post where you could have gone for free could be sold for $66,000. There's one that was sold recently for $69 million and all of these things. Jack Dorsey's and, was sold for over a million dollars. Thank you very much. I know it's valued $7 million. Imagine that, his first tweet, right? So we need to yeah. understand how do we jump on the bandwagon not, 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 not too early, but early enough that there are a lot of people to follow behind us. I think that's a strategy we need to consider. Because even when I started my podcast, YouTube was out of the question. Because what you've spoken about, that C, those algorithms would have swallowed us up. Yeah. But the concept of the podcast, although it's not new, it's still not flooded as much as, 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 as a YouTube um, space. And for every single listen we get on any platform, we get paid for versus the, the, the strict requirements that YouTube has where you have to meet certain requirements before you start getting paid, right? So mm -hmm. these are the things you have to consider. And don't look at these things as sacred cows. You don't have to have a YouTube account. It, you might have an account on the next big thing, right? And if you become an authority on the next big thing, Imagine how much value you can add or value you can get when other people start to join afterwards. Yep. Very much. Thank you very much for that, panelists. Uh, we just want to thank our audience members for you know those really searching questions and not just participating in that way, but actually t taking the time out to quote unquote attend. You know, so virtually you're here. And I'm certain that we all appreciate it, and especially the students. But in a bit of further interact with you, our audience, and we're going to be serving up some mood and answers in the form of prizes. And these prizes, you know, I, I tell you, these students are on point. These prizes are in keeping with what we are about here this evening. Um, for, let me just um, outline, we have six lovely prizes you can win. We will be giving away during this segment um, to three winners clearly who can correctly answer questions resulting from the discussion. Therefore, all information thrown out or put forward by Joe Marie, Kadia, and Stefan. You know, I hope you're listening intently because you're going to we're gonna come right back at you um, in, a, in a second. And the three remaining winners um, will be selected from those of you who will take the time out to answer the research questions which are integral to the process at the end of this evening's event. Your search questions are in the form of a Google link posted and pinned in the chat. All our winners will be contacted by members of the G14. Your prize is delivered to you. Prizes are sponsored by Makeup Studio, Days Signature, and Aviz Media. So for the first set of prizes, the first prize is a tripod. It goes along with what we're all about most of us, professional headshot from Aviz Media, a company founded by a past student of Karimat, and a gift voucher valued at $3,500 from Cleaning Queen Services, another company owned by a Karimat student. And that is for the, the, the first set of questions I'm going to be posing, Charlie. For those of you who are going to be filling out, and we're going to choose um, three of you, um, our audience members' surprises, 
prize is are depending on those of you who actually put it survey. First prize, again, a tripod. Second prize, a selfie light from the makeup studio. And third prize, another gift voucher valued at 3500 from Cleaning Queen service, Cleaning Services. So there you have it. Let me just get right into the questions. Okay, coming right up. All right, so first question. What, in personal branding, what attribute or what attribute impacts you the most but you don't own it? That's the first question. And it came out in the discussion, you know, that word was mentioned a lot. First question, what, in personal branding, what attribute impacts you the most but you don't own it? Within, the, within a defeat, you can't just lose it. And you really don't own it, okay? That's not question number one. Question number two, um, what, just name a core attribute of personal branding. And it's, it's, it's different from the one that you can lose. A core attribute, and Stefan keep, you know, hammering it home, hammering it home. And question number three, okay. Name one of the recommendations made by Joe Marie on how to amplify your personal brand. She made three recommendations, so name one of them. I trust you can recall, put them in the chat, and a member of the G14 will be in touch with you, and your prizes will be delivered to you. Okay? Fair enough. At this point, I just want to say um, this evening's student ed initiative has been a worthwhile undertaking on many fronts, on so many fronts. I'm so proud. I mean, for, you know, to, to come in contact with them, you know, in the way that I have, and then even as a former student of Karimak, you know, trust me, but I find I can just imagine how I'm feeling right now. I'm proud of you guys. But students' grades for this course it depends on, you know, all your support. Because clearly, I mean, they have put forward a well-organized event. This is not easy. And for me to even come out of my comfort zone and to be moderating this event, this is something unheard of. I mean, what, 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 is, what is it that this lady on TV say? Guys, I've never seen. Never see that. <laughs> but here I am because I have to support them right? the knowledge of the panelists were well prepared and highly informed and informative while all other stakeholders were heavily invested about the group of 14 Miss Nordia Panther is however best positioned to express gratitude to, her, to all those persons who you know, made this initiative possible so over to Ms. Panther. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure for me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown, for that. I'm not sure I know how to put into words what this panel discussion was really, um, what, what it really meant to, to all of us. But I want to say thank you to, well, before that, they always say, that all good things must come to an end and we've truly come to the end of something really really good so i want to say thank you to all the persons who've made it such a wonderful experience to our moderator miss suzette brown a past student of karimak as she rightfully said and also a former lecturer of mine thank you for accepting our invitation to be our moderator at this event you did a great job, excellent job there. You represented us extremely well. To our panelists, yes, uh, the discussion would have been nothing without your vibrance and your knowledge, all the expressions. We really loved it. So I want to say thanks to the only male, Mr. Stefan Campbell, who is also a past student of Karima and a former lecturer of mine as well. Uh, thank you for coming. And to the two amazing women, Miss Kadia Francis and Joe Marie Malcolm, 
thank you for sharing. <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing with us. You imparted so much information and perspective on the topic of your brand. We really do appreciate it. It would not be fair or just of me to leave out Mr. Andre Hewitt. He's the person behind the scenes. He ensures that everything is running smoothly. So we have to big him up for the work that he's done for us. We really do appreciate that, right? We also want to say thanks to our lecturer, Dr. Alpha Bika. When things got rough, we were uncertain. He was there. He was cheering us on. When he sent in everything, he told us good job. And we really appreciate that he allowed us to press on even when we're uncertain. And we love that kind of encouragement and support that he offered to us. So to all the attendees, if you ever decide, or at least when you do decide to join Carimac, the family of Carimac, then you will be in great hands. To our director, Dr. Prendergast, Thank you for playing such an integral part in the continuity of CARIMAC to ensure that students can have this platform to, to speak and to showcase the talents and different views on different topics. To all our sponsors, we thank you. So we're talking about Avis Studio, the Cleaning Queen Cleaning Services, Jay's Signature and the Makeup Studio, Thank you for your generosity. But to some of the most important persons with us, our attendees on YouTube, we could not have done it without you. We needed you to be here to hear what we have to say. We acknowledge your participation. We acknowledge your kudos that you give us sometimes. We thank you for being here with us. And we appreciate that you've made this an even richer experience for us. To all the members, last but not least, <laughs> to all the members of my team, there are so many, 14 of us really, I'll try not to miss anyone out, Miss Sasha Lynn Hay, Ruthann Nesbeth, Zaria Nasmith, Sebastian Jones, Dana Shea McIntosh, Savory Hyatt, Shamon Gordon, Shana K. Brown, Lacey Johnson, Pete Campbell, Janelle Francis, Janelle McFarlane, and Nikima Brown. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for the work that you've put in to make this event such a success. We thank you. Whatever contribution you made, we do appreciate it. And we thank you for coming on board. And I'll leave by reminding you that you are your brand. This webinar is accessible on the UEMONA WJC page. You can always rewatch if you need to be reminded of the gems that we got tonight. And remember, attendees, that we do have the survey pinned in the chat. You can, of course, do the survey to be in the runnings for the other three amazing prizes that we have left. And it's also an important part of our evaluation. So we encourage you or we ask for your support in this regard. Thank you. Remember, you are your brand. Good night. Well done, guys.